Hi, um, nice to see you all, and thanks for coming to my session. I'm Trustin, and I'm often known as a founder of Netty Project, which powers many large-scale services based on JVM. In this session, um, I'm going to introduce a new microservice framework called Armeria. Um, instead of being um, just a marketing pitch, I am going to show you some important um, design decisions I made uh, for Armeria and the reasoning behind those decisions. So you can learn what factors you must consider when choosing microservice frameworks. Someone here uh, might be thinking uh, already, like, what, uh, a microservice framework again, right? Yeah, but do the microservice frameworks scratch our itches well enough? I think there are still some area we, that are missing, especially when it comes down to RPC, such as uh, gRPC and Swift. In my opinion, um, there are five uh, important features a good microservice framework has to offer. Uh, simplicity and user friendliness are important for any frameworks and libraries. But uh, also, without a synchronous and reactive programming model, uh, your entire system will stop to function uh, even on a tiny uh, failure. And RPC protocols like gRPC and Drift are great for uh, building microservices, but um, you might not be happy with, uh, with them. Often neglected, but smooth migration from legacy system and integration with existing technologies are also very important because nobody wants to uh, build a service from scratch because they're already an existing legacy software you have built. And lastly, um, it's also worth considering client-side load balancing to reduce the number of uh, failure points in your system. So let me start with some very simple examples first to give you some idea, basic understanding of our Maria API. Uh, but to be honest, uh, it might not be as simple as you expected uh, because this level of simplicity uh, is pretty common these days. Uh, but don't be disappointed because it's going to be more and more interesting as we go. So this is a simple uh, Hello World server. We created a builder and specified HTTP and the HTTPS port 8080 and 8443. And during the development phase, we often use a self-signed self -signed, uh, certificate. So our Maria provides a very simple shortcut method so you can generate a self-signed certificate without any command line tools, without using any command line tools, which is pretty useful. And now what's interesting is here, we also support HA proxy, uh, which is gonna be useful when you work with uh, load balancers like uh, HA proxy or uh, Amazon Web Services Elastic Load Balancers. And also, what's even more interesting is this uh, 88 port number, which is the same with this port number. So usually, uh, if you specify the same port number for the same for different different protocols, uh, you're gonna your server will usually fail to start up, right? But in case of our Maria, our Maria can detect protocols from the first few bytes of the connection and then determine which protocol it's gonna talk. So it is completely okay to specify the same port number and our media will auto detect the protocol. This is especially useful when you're in a highly restricted environment, like where you can open only a few ports. And at last, we find a simple Lambda expression-based service. If as an input, we get context and request, and then we build 
a response from it. We retrieve this pet variable name via the context object and then build the response. And we bind it at this path. And then we build server and start. Pretty straightforward, right? You can also write your service using annotations, like you can do with many other popular web frameworks. The only difference from uh, the previous example is that now the path variable, oops, path variable is now injected as a method parameter, and the response is automatically translated from a string to a uh, response object internally and automatically. What about gRPC? Uh, once you compile your .proto file using the official protobuf compiler and import uh, implement your service logic by extending, oops, extending this generated abstract class, uh, all you need to do is to build a gRPC service using a builder pattern, pattern and add this service implementation to this service and build it. <coughs> Sorry. So this time this is a this is not a web server but a gRPC server. But you might think like, hey, uh, we can do it with this without Armeria, right? But this is a, only a tip of iceberg, so please be patient. <laughs> Drift, for the case of Drift, it's pretty much the same with gRPC. Here, we this time we compiled a .drift file using the official Drift compiler, and then we implement this interface to implement a Drift service. And <coughs> And then uh, bind, uh, wrap this service implementation with THTP service and then bind the service to our Maria server. And this time, this is a Thrift server. And now you have a full HTTP2 based Thrift server, uh, which is not yet possible with the official Thrift for Java. And this is a little bit more interesting. Uh, but and now it's getting a little bit more interesting. Um, you can mix and match uh, your different type of services, for example, RESTful service, Swift service, and gRPC service in the same server. Uh, as I will show later in this talk, um, this is extremely useful in production systems. Now that we know how our Maria API looks like, um, let me explain why our Maria chose a synchronous and reactive programming model. Um, <clears throat> again, some of you might still think like, um, our service is not that big. Maybe we don't need to do, uh, we don't need to go asynchronous. But um, the reality is, um, Synchronous services will hold your back really soon. So let's start from a very typical uh, synchronous microservice, which receives a bunch of requests from the clients and accesses many shards here. Um, we usually uh, split the backends into uh, multiple shards, right? And so that the data access is distributed nicely and evenly. So when everything is perfectly working fine, then the time spent for each shard will be same, ideally, right? Because all shards are operating optimally. However, let's say the second shard, oops, oh, the blue one is down and it's not responding on time and it's timing out, then the time spent for uh, the blue shard, the second shard will take a longer time. 
as a result, uh, the other shards, the, the time spent for the other shards are decreasing. And as a result, all worker strands will spend their time waiting for the second shard. So they spend <coughs> the time spent for the other shards will be very, very small. As a result, <coughs> As a result, at this point, the service is barely functional. Uh, even for requests that go to the first and third shards, will not work very well because it's the second shard is dominating its wall time. So this defeats the purpose of sharding. Uh, <coughs> this defeats the one of the main proposals of sharding. In a microservice architecture, um, this kind of failure is propagated to every service in your system, uh, which is often called cascading failure or domino effect. So in this case, uh, this service started to fail and then this is propagated to these three services and then these two services are also affected. As a result, uh, even if just this service has failed, all the other services are affected. As a result, um, the, the team who is responsible for these services and these services will also get an alarm even if just this is broken, which is not a good situation. <laughs> because every stakeholder of every service is, is going to be in trouble. So how could we solve this problem? How about adding more CPUs? Um, if you look into the metric of the system suffering this kind of issue, um, they are actually not very busy. Um, they are just waiting for the backends to respond. Um, and then how about adding more threats to the threat thread pool. Um, I think it's not a good idea either. Um, no matter how many threads you add, um, they will get busy like other threads in no time uh, because they have to wait for the timeout. So the threads will almost always gonna end up waiting for something. So let's say you added 100 threads and it's going to work just for a while, but they are all going to get busy. And so as a result, uh, synchronous programming often uh, leads to a fragile system uh, that falls apart, even in case of a single tiny backend failure. Uh, what's even worse is that the system um, does not utilize the given system resources efficiently either. For example, in this case, uh, let's say we added 100 threads, then each thread will compete for con compete with each other, compete against each other, and spend their many of, much of their time for context switching. And also, each thread requires extra memory. Need the list to the same. Of course, um, there are some workarounds like splitting thread pool for each shard, or tuning for tuning the maximum size of the thread pool, or tuning the maximum size of the call stack. But the fact is, you have to keep tuning. Let's say you have some changes in your backends, then you have to tune your parameters and thread pools. Uh, instead, uh, at line, we chose to go asynchronous. Uh, as a result, how we tune our services became much simpler. Uh, it's often just enough to look into just two parameters. Uh, first, heap size, total memory size, and the number of event loops. Um, 
So if you are getting too many requests, then you are often just enough by increasing heap size or tuning some GC parameters, then you are mostly fine. Uh, you're going to have to add a few more knobs, but usually these two parameters are the beginning part. <clears throat> now we know why a synchronous programming model is important, but um, it's not the only piece we need to build a robust microservice. It also has to be reactive. Uh, so why do we need to be reactive? Why does it matter? It's because it helps you to helps your service not blow up with auto memory adder um, under high load or handling a large amount of data. Um, for example, uh, let's say we have to send 10 megabytes of personalized response to each of 100,000 clients. In this case, uh, you cannot hold them in your memory because it's one terabyte, uh, unless you spend a lot of money on adding many, many, many machines. But if it's only for memory, then it's going to be a waste of money. So what we do is we have to stream it. So when we stream the data, uh, we have to be cautious about the speed of data production. So if we send the data too fast, the receiving part will not uh, be fast enough to receive all of them on time. As a result, the, re uh, the sending part, the server, will buffer will have to buffer all those data the pending data into their memory and then as a result we have the same problem so we are going to have hit an hour memory editor again so we chose to implement an api called reactive streams uh, for our maria to solve this kind of problem and this is also useful to for interoperating with other reactive streams implementations such as Rx Java or Spring Web Flux, Project Reactor. So here's the diagram that shows the difference between traditional services and reactive services. So a traditional service often loads the entire data into memory and then process it entirely and then send a response to the client. Uh, unlike traditional approach, reactive approach talks to the client and data source uh, and fetch the data one by one so that uh, the receiving part and sending part do not suffer from uh, too much buffering. So that's a main difference. So during this communication, the client and server and server and data source communicates all with each other to make sure that the buffer usage is not high enough so that the throughput remains, but memory usage is control, under control. Because everything but the client and server is asynchronous and reactive in our area, um, it's extremely easy to write a reactive proxy server or API gateway. Here, uh, we simply uh, forwarded the received request to the backend by calling client.execute. It's possible uh, because our Maria client, our Maria server are all reactive and they are all HTTP2. Uh, so all back pressure and memory buffer usage is automatically controlled in just six lines. In reality, you'll have to add or remove some headers. So please take a look at the complete example later in the link. Uh, many microservice frameworks, including Armeria, is based on HTTP, but uh, it doesn't mean it supports only RESTful APIs. Um, there are various compelling alternatives to REST in microservices. And RPC protocols like gRPC and Drift uh, are good candidates. 
Uh, if you are considering a gRPC or a script, you must check if your framework supports them and check if your framework is going to support it nicely so that you don't have any issues working when working with it, just like when you are working with RESTful APIs. So this is a simple example of a usual IPC call over uh, HTTP, to HTTP, which has failed at business logic level. Um, so HTTP status here is 200 OK, uh, which means successful, ironically, but actually it's failure. So it is pretty common for RPC protocols to use 200 OK for this kind of situation because the body actually contain, contains the result. So they are hidden under the cover. So how about access logs? If you look into the access log, uh, there are not much information to look into here because the request parameters and request method name and response status and return value or exceptions are all hidden here and it's not shown here at all. So you do not really get anything you want. So this problem is often called impedance mismatch between RPC and G HTTP. And Aramaria tries to solve this problem by providing a dedicated API for accessing a request log in programmatic and structured manner. So we record a lot of information. For example, timing, long level timing information for DNS and request response timing. And also, of course, because it's uh, it's HTTP, so we record everything as well as H all HTTP headers and some previews for response bodies and request bodies. And of course, we record RPC level information like uh, method name and parameters and return values. And also, because it's programmable, a user can attach any useful information. For example, user ID, uh, and many other information. And before showing the actual API for accessing those informations, um, let me explain a simple concept called decorator, uh, which is basically a design pattern for separation of concern. You can decorate any Armeria service using a decorator, uh, for example, using the decorate method here. So in the decorator, you are given with three objects, dec delegate and context and request. So delegate is the next service or a dec the next decorator in the request chain and the context and request is used for performing an operation, right? Uh, so in many, in our area, many features are implemented as a decorator, so please keep in mind what I'm going to show in this presentation are also decorator in many cases. So to retrieve the request log, we use a decorator. So we decorate it and then we add a listener, log listener, to our context log. Then uh, when the request log is ready, this part of the code is going to be called. So here's an example uh, implementation of the request log listener. As you see, you get all the RPC level information easily. So it's pretty easy. And although it's not shown in this example, you can retrieve many more properties uh, here. Uh, like I explained in the previous slides, for example, timing information, HTTP level information, or your custom properties. At line, uh, we serialize the request log and send it to Elasticsearch via Apache Kafka and search them using Kibana. So as we see, there are many useful information here, like the type of client, 
and request ID, client IP address, and there are many other stuff like RPC request to response encoded in JSON. And also we record many other useful properties like where a user is based, things like that. And what's interesting is that this comes almost for free thanks to Armeria's logging API. And Armeria even provides a decorator uh, you can use out of the box, adding a, a simple bit of configuration. Another long-standing uh, issue of RPC is that it all, it is, it's often hard to make an ad hoc call, uh, like sending an RPC request without any ID setup. Uh, so far, we had to find a proper service definition file, such as .drift or .product file, and then set up the development environment, like a build tool and IDE, and write some code that make an actual RPC call. Uh, it takes time and energy, as you know. Uh, in contrast, for HTTP, it's really simple. You can just write a tool. You can just use a tool like a CURL or even Telnet to send a request. So uh, we made something more convenient and even collaborative in our Maria, which is called documentation service. So if you add it to an Armeria server, it will automatically scan all supported services, such as gRPC, Swift, and provide a web-based UI for browsing and invoking them conveniently. In the future, we hope to extend it into something bigger, like uh, providing a monitoring console or a configuration editor, like browsing the current server metrics or adjusting log level. This is a a uh, screenshot of doc service, which looks similar to that of Javadoc. On the left pane, there's a list of services, and on the right pane, there's a list of parameters and return values and exceptions which might be thrown during the invocation. And if you scroll down the right pane, you're gonna see a form like this. So once you enter a request, in JSON and press a submit button, it actually sends a request for you. So there's no need for looking for the proper .proto or .drift file at all, or, and you don't really need to set up any ID or build system. They are completely unnecessary. On top of that, uh, once you submit a request, your browser location changes so that the request is encoded here. So if you copy and share this URL with your colleagues by sending an instant message, for example, then they can reproduce the problematic request very easily. Let's say there's a bug in this service, so you send this request and the result is not correct, Something something's wrong, then you can just copy and paste in your chat application to send a message, then uh, the guy who received this message can reproduce the problem really easily. It's even easier than working with HTTP. This level of simplicity and convenience was not possible for RPC protocols before. And also, uh, besides structured logging and documentation service, Armeria offers some additional features not available in the official gRPC and Drift uh, implementations for Java. For example, uh, Armeria supports both HTTP 1 and 2 for both gRPC and Drift. And also, gRPC web support is provided out of the box. Uh, so it's very easy to interoperate with uh, your front end apps. There's no actual, there's no, there's really no need for setting up a proxy server or a sidecar like Envoy just because, uh, because you want to implement gRPC web. So please also, please also keep in mind, our Mary has decorators to solve many uh, common problems, which are sometimes not available in the upstream. For example, uh, Armeria provides out-of-the-box decorators for metric collection 
and distributed tracing, authentication, cross-origin, resource sharing, and re request throttling, and many more. And um, do you remember the mix and match example I showed you earlier in this talk? You do, right? Uh, it's not only for gRPC and Thrift. So you can mix and match all kinds of things in our area. You can serve REST API, static files, metrics, health checks from load balancers, and even traditional web apps that run on top of Tomcat or Jetty. Uh, all on a single TCP IP port and in a single JVM. This is a mix and match. This mix and match ability is extremely useful in production because a service is not uh, homogeneous but often heterogeneous genus, genius in real life. Speaking of being heterogeneous, um, it's not always about programming languages and protocols. It's also about libraries and frameworks. Um, each organization chooses um, different technologies because they face different challenges from each other. Uh, it basically means uh, microservice framework needs to be unopinionated when migrating with uh, and integrating with other technologies because we don't want any restrictions when you choose your favorite library or frameworks. So that being said, our Marriott team made an early decision, design decision, that works well for diverse third-party technologies. Uh, some microservice frameworks try to provide many features in wholesale manner like to use this, you have to use this and that and, and so on. Um, but that's absolutely not the case for Armeria. Armeria only focuses what focuses on what it does well and lets you choose what you like. You can choose your favorite that dependency injection frameworks. There are Spring Juice. There are many dependency injection frameworks in the wild, right? Uh, and also you can choose many different data access libraries as well as the protocols. Uh, all these features of our area, like an opinionate, opinion, un unopinionated integration and the ability to mix and match service made our area ideal for various use cases at production. Uh, and let me show some of them from the next slides. I think most of you already know about Slack, the chat-based collaboration service. Um, Slack was using Thrift since 2015 as their internal RPC protocol, but they chose to migrate to gRPC because of various reasons. However, because the switch from Thrift and gRPC uh, can happen, cannot uh, happen all at once, um, they had to run both gRPC and Thrift until all services stop using Thrift. As you know, um, Armeria is perfect for mixing and matching uh, different services like Thrift and gRPC. And they also, uh, so they utilized Armeria to do that. And also, they also utilized various uh, out-of-the-box service implementations like Prometheus Exposition Service, for exposing the service metrics to Prometheus, and health check service for serving health check requests from load balancers, and Brave service for distributed tracing, and of course, the doc service to browse and invoke RPC services conveniently. And this is a part of their production code I copied from their slides. Um, as you see, they first add services like health check service and doc service, and then various custom services, including Thrift and gRPC. Uh, now their migration is pretty successful, and they are still using Armeria. And there will be actually a session from Luno from uh, Slack Technologies right after this session. So please do not leave this room if you want to hear more about this story. At 
line or Marion is being used for many uh, parts of the service, but here I'll focus on an in-app sticker store. Previously, it was built using Spring Boot and Tomcat running and running synchronous Strict services on top of Serverlet. Uh, it was using Apache HTTP client for talking to other services. Uh, because they kept facing the cascading service failures already, uh, like I mentioned in synchronous services and asynchronous services before in this talk, uh, so they wanted to switch to a synchronous programming model. However, their code base is pretty huge, so they had to migrate gradually. Uh, so they like, and they liked the Spring Boot, so wanted to keep using it. So they kept using it and just switched the main networking engine from Tomcat to Armeria, which gave, a, gave them a free upgrade from HTTP 1 to 2 as a bonus. Now, the legacy Tomcat is run as an Armeria service, and uh, new asynchronous Swift services are served directly by Armeria, so there's no Tomcat or serverlet overhead between the new Swift service and Armeria at all. So the switch is pretty uh, efficient and effortless. They also switched it to Armeria's HTTP2 client uh, to take advantage of HTTP2 and client-side load balancing. I'm going to cover about it a little bit later. So as a result, today, uh, most of their services are fully asynchronous, and the result is dramatic. For example, here, by making three synchronous calls into three asynchronous calls, um, they reduce the latency by almost by five times. And by using HTTP2 clients, they also reduce the number of the HTTP connections like very dramatically, uh, more than 100 times. So this reduces the over-resource utilization and the latency of the system. <coughs> and enabling distributed um, tracing was a piece of cake to them because it's just as simple as adding a single decorator to the services. So by adding Brave service, they now get the detailed call timing information uh, for each services in the microservice architecture. Uh, like in like in this screenshot, uh, so as you see, the get product v2 is taking a lot of time. But actually, if you look into this graph, the 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 real bottleneck is here and here and here instead of this. So you get all the imp important information required for troubleshooting performance <laughs> issues in your microservice. The last case I'm going to show is a project called. Uh, a project which was built from scratch rather than migrating from an, a legacy service. Uh, Kakao Pay is a Korean company which is uh, behind a popular mobile payment service in Korea. Uh, they built a firm banking gateway which is required when talking to value added network or to talk to Korean banks. Um, so they wrote the gateway in Kotlin. Um, when using Kotlin, it can be somewhat annoying to work with Java libraries uh, because of nullability issues and many other stuff. Um, however, it's not the case for uh, Armeria because it's using uh, nullability annotations everywhere. And also, this time, the developers uh, wanted to choose something uh, more interesting, like a Spring Webflex, which is a new kid on the block. So, they wanted to mix and match Spring Webflux and gRPC into a single virtual machine, so they chose to use Armeria this time again. So, because Armeria is also a drop-in uh, replacement for Spring's reactive network layer, you can just replace it. Then you can run your Spring Webflux services on top of Armeria, instead of using the default stack, and then you can also serve gRPC traffic without any overhead between gRPC service and your networking layer. No uh, abstraction layer like uh, Spring Webflux. 
So far, this talk was mostly about receiving requests, but sending requests also has an important role in microservices. Um, should we send a request to a load balancer to talk to a cluster, or should we use client-side load balancing? Um, each option has its own better, uh, <coughs> its own pro pros and cons, but in my opinion, it's often better uh, choosing client-side load balancing. So let's let me show you why. So load balancers or reverse proxies uh, were the options people choose traditionally when creating a cluster of the same services. And they distribute load fairly well and offload the overhead of handling TLS. And they also perform uh, automatic health check periodically, like every few seconds. And it had a kind of service discovery because everything the client has to know is just the load balancer's IP address. Uh, however, uh, having a load balancer in the middle means uh, many disadvantages as well. Uh, for example, uh, more points of failure because if a uh, load balancer dies, everything dies, and uh, increase the license because there are more hops and potentially uneven load distributions if your load balancer does not understand HTTP2. And also, needless, needlessly, to say about the cost of operating load balancers. So Armelia tries to solve this problem in two ways. The first part of the solution is client-side load balancing, which lets you client lets a client discover the available host and choose a target host auto autonomously. It currently supports Kubernetes-style DNS. Uh, records and Apache Zookeeper as a discovery mechanism. The second part of the solution is, of course, using Armeria, uh, uh, which ships OpenSSL-based high-performance TLS and EPOL transport from Netty. Again, um, you can run different types of services in a single port and JVM because of mix and match property of Armeria. So there's no need for load balancers or API gateways and this simplifies your microservice architecture quite a bit uh, and reduces the, number of, reduces the number of failure points because load balancer is not here, not in this architecture. So if you are currently using a traditional alpha load balancer or your, your load balancer does not understand HTTP2, you might have a problem with HTTP2 connections because an HTTP2 connection is kept alive very long. So as you see from this graph, uh, some of our services had an issue with load distribution for HTTP requests uh, because the load balancers we were using did not understand HTTP2. At one point in time, uh, the difference uh, is not anymore after applying our Maria's client-side load balancing. So problem is completely gone. If you use Armeria both on the client side and server side as a side, um, as a bonus, a special HTTP2 health check mechanism is activated. Uh, Armeria client will send a long uh, polling health check request. Um, this request this this reduces the number of health check requests significantly, uh, like from every 10 seconds or every five seconds, uh, by using the long polling request. Uh, the request is sent like only uh, every five minutes, for example. Also, because it's long polling, uh, a server can notify its status change really quickly, uh, almost in real time. So you don't have to check every few seconds. Of course, this is fully backwards compatible because uh, it's enabled, activated only when a server tells the long polling is activated. So it's uh, fully backward compatible. And this is the example that shows how you do uh, client-side load balancing with service discovery in just a few lines. Uh, but we are running out of time, so let me skip this. But it's basically about doing some health check and Kubernetes style uh, service discovery and round robin. And then we build it with automatic uh, retries and circuit breakers, all done by adding a single line to each 
builder calls, then this client gets clients. This client does client side load balancing, round robin, and many other stuff. Okay, we covered various important aspects to consider when adopting microservice architecture and how they affected the design decisions when building our area. However, uh, it's not the end of the story, so there are still many things to do. So if it would be really nice if you give it a try and let us know uh, if we can, if there's a room for improvement, we are gonna be very happy to do many things for you. So currently our Maria is at version 0.96 and we hope to release 1.0 before the end of this year. So I think your environment is really important and there are many things to do post after 1.0. So it's gonna be a lot of fun if you join us and uh, work together. And I hope you like this talk, and if you are interested in our area, please visit our GitHub repository, or, and if you're interested in more use cases, uh, stay here and uh, watch uh, Luno talk about Slack stories. And after uh, two, these two technical sessions, there's also a two-hour hands-on lab uh, for that shows how to work with Armeria and Spring Webflux and gRPC a little bit later. So think about joining that hands-on lab too. Thank you.